Way to be TV, where there's a better way to be than atheist or theist. My name is Elise Elrod. It is Thursday, April 21st, 2016. Joni and I co host Way to be TV. She will be keeping us abreast of the chat room activities this evening. Good evening, Joni. Evening, Elise. Instead, we're going to finally talk about the Gospel of James. Joni told Good. me earlier tonight, she said, uh, she said, it got right to a climax point when you were almost finished with the first segment whenever the guy came on the air. And she said, the story is very interesting. I wish I could hear the rest of it. And so you have us all on pins and needles. The Gospel of, the gospel of James se seems to also paint a picture uh, that's slightly different, uh, somewhere, some places significantly different than you've heard, but probably more similar to the to the archaeological digs and things that I found when I was in Israel. Tonight we will be talking about the non-canonical book, The Gospel of James. Scholars think The Gospel of James first began to circulate about mid-2nd century. The Gospel of James begins by telling its readers there was a very wealthy man named Joachim. He was known to offer his gifts in two amounts. One he offered as a gift to God for his own sins to be forgiven. The other he offered as a gift to all the people. On the Sabbath day, a man named Reuben accuses Joachim of being presumptuous. Reuben tells Joachim that every righteous man of Israel has offspring. Reuben insists Joachim, who has no children, should not be giving his gifts before everyone. So Joachim searches the records of Israel to determine if this is true. There he finds that Reuben is right. Every righteous man of Israel, giving gifts, has kids. Joachim remembers Abraham. When Abraham and Sarah were very old, God gave them Isaac. So Joachim, a married man, now upset, did not go home to his wife. Instead, he goes out into the wilderness to pray. He wants the same deal from God afforded to Abraham and Sarah. He is determined not to eat, drink, or go home to his wife, until God answers his prayer. His wife's name is Anna. Meanwhile, Joachim has failed to tell Anna where he is. Worried, thinking she is now a widow, Anna mourns for her husband and for being childless. As the Sabbath day approaches once again, her handmaiden Judith comes to her and offers her help. Anna rejects her. Judith, feeling rejected herself, tells Anna that God keeps her from bearing children. Anna, even more upset, continues to mourn. She then puts on her wedding clothes and goes for a walk in a garden. As she is walking, she sat down under a tree. She began praying to God the same prayer her husband is offering in the wilderness. Please, God, bless me as you bless Sarah with Isaac. She looks up into the branches of the tree. There she sees birds nesting. Who am I? she asks God. I have been banned from the temple. I am mocked because I am childless. These birds are blessed with children. Why not me? The beasts of the earth are blessed with children. Why not me? Even the waters stir and produce fish. Why not me? Even the soil produces crops. Why not me, God? Then an angel appears and says, Anna, Anna, God heard you. You are about to conceive and give birth. Anna is, of course, overjoyed. She tells the angel, whether it's a boy or a girl, I will offer the child to God to serve God for all his life. About this same time, back in the wilderness, Joachim has already had a similar experience. Two angels show Anna, her husband, coming home with his flock. An angel has already told Joachim that Anna is pregnant. The flock Joachim is bringing is to be divided as gifts to God, the priests, the elders, and to all the people. Remember, his gifts were not accepted earlier because he and Anna were childless. Anna runs up to Joachim and hugs his neck. 
See, I am no longer a widow, and I am no longer childless. The relieved Joachim took a nap. The next day, it is time to offer those gifts again. Joachim sets up a test for himself to determine if he is now worthy to give in the temple. By looking at the ornament on the priest's head, Joachim would be able to determine if he was now cleansed from his sins. So Joachim offered up his gifts and then carefully scrutinized the priest's ornament. There he saw no sign of sin in himself. His gifts would be accepted and Anna would soon birth his child. Now the scripture says Anna gave birth in the seventh month of her pregnancy. Later Anna cleansed herself, began nursing her baby girl, and named her baby girl Mary. When Mary was six months old, Anna wanted to know if she could stand. She set her down. Not only did she stand, Mary walked six steps back into Anna's arms. Then Anna declared that Mary shall not walk again until she has been taken to the temple. Anna made a private place for Mary in the house. She did not allow anything unclean to enter this private place, and she called the virgin daughters of Israel to entertain Mary. Upon her first birthday, Mary's father, Joachim, held a huge feast for the priests, the scribes, and the elders, and for all the people. He then brought Mary out of her private place and presented her. The priest blessed her and declared Mary would be famous forever. The people replied, Amen. Her mother, Anna, then lifted Mary up and took her back to her private place. There she began nursing Mary and singing a song to her. The shame was over. Anna asked herself, Who will tell everyone Anna is now nursing a baby? Then Anna returned from Mary's private place to serve her guest. When Mary turned two years old, Joachim, her father, declared it's time to take her to the temple. He feared God would think he had broken his promise and his gifts would again be unacceptable to God. Anna said we need to wait a year so that Mary will not begin to miss her parents. Joachim agreed. So they waited another year. By the time Mary turned three, Joachim presented his plan for the journey. To keep Mary unafraid, the virgin daughters of Israel would light torches and carry them alongside the family. When they arrived at the temple, the priest received Mary with a kiss. They once again blessed Mary and declared she would be famous throughout the ages. Joachim set Mary on the third step of the temple. The three-year-old Mary danced. Her parents then left her. Convinced Mary was in God's hands, they went home without Mary, amazed in praising God. While in the temple, Mary was given her food daily by an angel. The scripture says she was cared for like a dove. But when she reached the age of 12, there arose a serious concern. Something would have to be done. Mary was now a young woman. The temple would not be defiled by having a young woman live there. So what's the answer? You can't put a 12-year-old girl back out on the street. Before moving on with our story, we will stop here and talk about it a bit. Why would there be a statue of, of Mary as a child and a, and a chapel dedicated to Mary as a child um, if people among the population did not think about Jesus' mother when she was a child? You know, I never, I never heard any stories of her as a child. Exactly, exactly. And yet, there's this statue in Israel outside the Pool of Bethesda. Is this little, is this little church or this little chapel? And there, in front of it, is a statue of Mother Mary as a child. <laughs> so, yeah. We know that the the timing of these writings, um, you know, the Gospel of James. When was it written? The Gospel of James began to circulate, scholars think, around the middle of the second century. Okay? Now you have to understand the Gospel of John was written in like AD 95 at the end of the first century. The Gospel of James and the Gospel of John that's in our Bibles aren't but about 50 years apart. Well, that's why my thought was why was this excluded? Right. Um, yeah. Since it was at that time. Um, and it's mostly because, you know, you have. Uh, what a child becoming a woman and then at that point she was not clean enough to be part of the patriarchal society.
She was obviously, when she became 12, according to the Gospel of James, an issue. Now, it might have had to do with what happens with a young woman when they get up to be about that age. Because it was considered to be a very unclean thing, simply because they didn't understand it. But, right. um, at any rate, the young woman could no longer be in the temple. This wasn't going to work. And so, we're going to talk about how how she managed to what they how they managed to solve their dilemma how they managed to get her out of the temple now what what do you what do you think about the gospel of james what do y'all think about it Colleen says she feels sorry for mary growing up like a caged bird yeah yeah absolutely yeah, <laughs> yeah taken from her parents and and um you know living even when she was with her parents in a, a little back room you know not allowed right. to walk we don't even age. know how Strange. females were raised in that day and age, other than the fact yeah. that we think they did all the work and <laughs> carried all the water and <laughs> right. made all the food. And <laughs> chopped they were the just wood, property. They were just property. I don't even think they did all that stuff. They were just like cattle. They probably just w wandered back and forth with water. Even though they consider Mary to be the most esteemed woman of God ever, uh, and you know, raised in the temple and fed by an angel and all of this stuff, even though they see that and feel that, the way they handle her life from this point forward um, is is basically a way that they could not handle a, a male figure at all. They would never dream of a handling a male figure of the way you're about to hear about the way they handled getting her out of the temple. Do you all see the uh, similarities? Um, between like the Abraham and Sarah and Isaac story, in essence, is the Mary and Joachim story. Yes, yes. I, that's exactly why I was thinking about the time frame of it, because I was thinking right. that exact same thing. So it's very similar, um, if not the exact same kind of uh, right. thought, you know, written down. These stories are similar. They have a pattern and they're repeated. And people who wrote uh, stories knew of these stories. And so they wrote another story like it. You get my point? Mm -hmm. And all this stuff builds on itself. All this stuff builds on itself. Absolutely. And that's, and that's important to look at and it makes you realize that there is no reason for us to adopt these supernatural stories as having some huge impact on our lives, but rather what has impact on our lives is the lessons they teach and the, and the, and the principles that they lay down. It's just a repeated pattern. It goes on and on in the Bible. And some of it you could also insert John, you know, from Elizabeth. That's that, mean, exactly. That's you know, right. That's an right. elderly yeah. woman who is not of childbearing age has a child. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. We're going we're gonna to do the second segment. And you're going to hear some things about Joseph, and he's got kids, and how all this ties together. Before we get back to our story, I thought I might share with you a very short passage from my journal to Israel. Our story thus far has been about Mary living in the temple as a child. In my journal to Israel online, this is photos 349 through 353, audio track 16b. From the Antonio Fortress, we walked to the Church of St. Anne at the Pool of Bethesda. The acoustics were extraordinary. Again, my engineering interests were stimulated. The Crusader Church is constructed entirely of stone. It was spared by the Muslims because they used it as a school. There is not a flat surface in the many-chambered roof of this church. Normal speaking tones were nearly indiscernible. But when chants were made by Dr. Theon, the sound was as clear as a bell. The church housed the only statue in the ancient world of Mary being presented as a child. There we sang and read scripture. Now back to our story. We left Mary, now 12 years old, still living in the temple. There's a problem. The priest called a council to discuss what to do about a young woman residing in the temple. This was only for God's men. A woman living in the temple was an abomination, yet Mary was a gift from God, so they decided to pray about it and do whatever God revealed. Of course, an angel of the Lord appeared to the chief priest while he was praying. The solution was to marry her off. All the widowers would come to the temple and be given a rod. 
from the correct rod would come a sign indicating who would betroth Mary. So a trumpet sounded, gathering all those men who had lost their wives. Joseph, a man with sons from a previous marriage, was among them. The chief priest took all the rods and went into the temple and prayed over them. Then he gave them back to the widowers. Nothing happened until the last rod was given to Joseph. A dove sprang from the rod and landed on Joseph's head. So the high priest said to Joseph, You have been chosen to take God's virgin. Joseph protested, I have kids, and I am an old man, and she is only a young girl. I do not want to be ridiculed by Israel. The priest then threatens Joseph with God's wrath. So Joseph took Mary home. As soon as he got her settled in, he says, I'll be back later. I'm going to work. God will look after you. Later, the priest told a council to decide about making a veil for the temple. All the virgins of Israel from the tribe of David were called together. Those who went looking for them found only seven. Then they remembered Mary would also qualify and should be considered such, as she was betrothed only and still a virgin. Then they cast lots. Mary drew the short straw. Then in a Betsy Ross moment, Mary went home and began to make the veil from the elegant materials they gave her. Mary got thirsty and went to fetch some water. While fetching water, she heard a voice and was afraid. She ran back home and returned to her task of making the temple veil. Then an angel appeared. The angel told her she was blessed by God. She would have a baby that would be named Jesus. Her baby would save the world from their sins. Mary told the angel that she was the slave of God. Bring it on. Then she finished making the veil and delivered it to the temple. There the priest took the veil from her and told her God had made her name great. She would be blessed by all the generations. Then Mary went off to a relative's house, a woman named Elizabeth. There she stayed with Elizabeth as her abdomen grew. Eventually, she went home afraid of what people might do to her. By now, she was 16 years old. Then Joseph got home from work. But it was not like Joachim and Anna, both happy to know Anna was pregnant. Joseph was shocked. When he saw Mary was pregnant, he blamed himself. I got her from the temple, a virgin. I've neglected her. Then he thought, who did this? This is just like Adam. He was praising God and the snake got a hold of Eve. Now it's happened to me, he said. Then also, like Adam, Joseph blamed Mary. Why did you do this? You came from the temple where you danced and were cared for by an angel. Mary wept. I have been faithful. I know no man, Mary said. Joseph replied, So then how did you get pregnant? Mary said, I don't have a clue. So Joseph let her be for a bit. He wondered what he would do. If I hide her, I will be going against the law of God. If I turn her over to the people of, for punishment, I may be guilty of killing the innocent. So Joseph went to bed. In his sleep, an angel appears to comfort him. Joseph is assured the baby is from God and will save the world. He awoke refreshed, praising God. So let's talk about this before we move on. That's anyway. a very, very interesting story. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it though? Isn't it, think about this. How, how old was he when he took her home? How old was she when he took her home and said, I'm going to work. Um, well, I'll be back later and God will look after you. How old? Twelve. 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 I'm going to work Twelve. for four years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> how old was she when he got back? Sixteen. He went to work for four years. <laughs> She's not an elephant. I have no idea. I How did not know. I did not know if y'all saw that or not. But he was gone for four years, according to that story. Unless it's two different work days, and they just didn't say when he got back the first time. <laughs> or two different time clocks. I don't know. You know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, way gracious. At any rate. Maybe he was um, a long-range trucker. <laughs> yeah. That's something. What do you think about that story, Colleen? 
Holy cow, uh, I was thinking <laughs> that Jesus was the first uh, test tube baby in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think they need to go check out Since the extra raven. Neither one had anything house. to do with getting pregnant. Uh, we'll get to that in a we minute. We already don't think that they counted time the same way we did. I was, that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, I don't think they did either. I don't think Protestants think of Mary as any kind of supernatural anything, but Catholics do. No, but I, I yeah, that's true. I, I, I agree. Um, but I wonder if, you know, this story, when you put it together with all the other stories, it certainly would make one think that there is some validity to the story. Maybe not anyone in particular, but if many people are reporting the same thing that or very similar, that there may be some basis of fact within it. Yeah, but you have to remember this, and, and, and I know, if, if, I don't think the basis of fact is the supernatural parts, but I know, I know that um, if you read just the Gospels that we have and compare what, they, what they're saying, there are significant differences in them. But you have to remember, even the very first story of any kind, whether it be in our Bible or in the books that were written back in that day that are not in our Bible, all those were written long after, they, from the second half of the first century, from the second half of the first century on. The Gospel of Mark would be our first, our first amount of detail, and it's not very detailed. The detailed stuff, especially related to the birth and all of that, does not come until about A.D. 75 in the book of Matthew, A.D. 70, somewhere in there, in the book of Matthew. When you say there's some validity in it because people are telling the same stories, they're rehearsing the same stories. By this time, they've been rehearsing the same stories for a hundred years. Yeah, But I guess if you took away the, the um, quote-unquote virgin birth and just put it as a birth, I mean, the rest of the stuff is very believable. Right, that's what I say about that's the reason I say that the way is very believable, that what he taught and and those kinds of things, the, the things that they remembered, the sayings and the teachings and the principles would have been things that would have been remembered universally. Those were things that impacted in the great in the greatest ways. Essentially if you if you took away that whole virgin thing, I mean, yeah, she got pregnant and by whom, who knows? And yet, you know, um, then there's no supernatural. Right. And there right. are all very similar yeah. stories that really could have some basis in fact, because as we know, a 12-year-old could be pregnant. And at that time, if they lived to 30, that was probably a very ripe old age. And so, you know, if you saw that someone was getting pregnant like Elizabeth or, you know, Anna, when they were in their 30s, well, we know nowadays that that's not really that old to get pregnant. Right. And in those days, the greatly admired became known as a god or a son of God. They were revered. The people who were revered, they made up, they made up supernatural stories about them. I mean, the idea that Hercules actually lived might be very plausible. The idea that Hercules was super, had super strength and super powers and all that right. kind of stuff right. is not very likely at all. And so... The, but, They're discounting but, but, adrenaline. They were well, after him. The, the acquiring of supernatural powers and supernatural status, like being a god or son of God or whatever, those things came from the fact that people admired a certain figure. We have to, realize, you know, we have to realize that this is just the way they communicated. And everybody yeah. thinks if you say anything negative about the stories as far as them being true is concerned, you know, a lot of people don't like to hear a person say that. But it, that doesn't mean a person is saying that the people who wrote this were evil or had some sinister motive. Right. They right. were just communicating in the way people back then communicated. Right. I and mean, that's they 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 lifted their heroes up and they lifted them up by by making them supernatural and giving them super status. Okay. And their way of communicating had always been storytelling. Right. Always. I mean, yeah. But this was, I mean, writing had not been around for a whole long time. I don't think at that point. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, that it had been storytelling. And, you know, you, when you make up a story, you make it as exciting as you can. Right, right. So here we go again. This is, this is segment three. We left Joseph and Mary having just had a premarital fight over the mysterious pregnancy. An angel of the Lord calmed Joseph down. They are at peace for now, but soon others get involved in their marital business. Much of the story from here is much like the Christian Gospels. Some is not. 
a scribe went to the priest and accused Joseph of being the biological father. The priest accused both Mary and Joseph. Both mother and father deny having been involved in the creation of the baby. Then the priest sets up a test of their guilt or innocence. They had to drink some holy water and go out into the wilderness one at a time. When each comes back, the holy water has revealed no sin. All the people were amazed. So the priest relents. If God finds no fault in you, neither do I. Joseph and Mary both go home, glad it's over, praising God. As the story moves on, Augustus decrees the census to be taken, much like the Christian Bible. Joseph and Mary are traveling to register for the census. Joseph is walking. Mary is riding a donkey. Joseph's son was leading the donkey. About halfway there, Mary says, get me down off this donkey. The baby within me wants out. Joseph gets her down and says, we are in the middle of the wilderness. There is no place to hide your shame. But they found a cave. Again, here I want to read you a bit of my journal to Israel. It's about the Church of the Nativity. In my journal to Israel online, this is photos 277 through 283. Audio 6A. After we walked a few blocks through the excitement that was Bethlehem this day, we came to the Church of the Nativity. It is built over the cave, which is the traditional site of Jesus' birth. It is also the oldest church in Israel. The church dates back to the 4th century, with 6th century renovations and later repairs made by the Crusaders. When the Persians came and destroyed all the churches, they entered this church and noticed the wise men depicted on the walls. The wise men looked somewhat Persian, and therefore the church was spared. We entered the church through what is known as the Door of Humility. Its header is low enough that all but children would have to bow to pass through. We walked through the Greek Orthodox Basilica, past the poor box, and down a set of stairs that led to the cave now known as the Chapel of the Nativity. This long cave was once used to house animals and people for the night. It is thought to be similar to the one that housed the manger of Jesus' birth. A silver star has been placed at the spot commemorating the birth. The original star was gold, but has been stolen. Responsibility for the theft is said to have caused the war between the Russians and the Turks. Interestingly enough, there is a wall at Mid-Cave so that the Greek Orthodox and Catholic do not have to enter the same way through the Greek Orthodox Church. Back to our story. Joseph, leaving Mary with his sons, goes out to find a Hebrew woman to help Mary deliver. Again, much follows, similar to the Christian birth narratives in our Bible. There is also a scene of Joseph walking and experiencing frozen time that suddenly restarts again. Joseph encounters a woman coming down from some hills. He tells her he needs a midwife. Who is it that needs a midwife, she asks him. My betrothed, Joseph answered. She's not your wife, Joseph answers. It's complicated. <laughs> she grew up in the temple, and we drew lots to see who'd get her. She is not my wife, but she conceived a child. Oh, and by the way, by the Holy Spirit. The midwife says, you're kidding. Joseph says, come and you'll see. When they went to the cave, there was a bright cloud hovering inside the cave. The midwife instantly acknowledged the miraculous sign. The cloud immediately left the cave and a bright light replaced it. The light began to dim until an infant could be seen nursing with Mary. As the story continues, Joseph and Mary are made aware of the controversy that surrounds them. They also discovered King Herod had entered the picture. The slaughter of the innocent, two years and younger, had been ordered. Fearing for the baby's life, Mary wrapped Jesus in swaddling clothes and laid him in a barn for livestock. So here in the Gospel of James, Jesus was born in a cave and only hidden from Herod in a manger in a barn. The idea of no room in the inn isn't mentioned in the Gospel of James. The Gospel ends with a bit about John the Baptist's father, Zacharias. He was a high priest who was killed. The Gospel fragment's concluding passage is in the first person. 
I, James, wrote the account in Jerusalem. Grace to all who fear the Lord. Amen. So let's talk about this for just a bit. Okay. So, um, I know I was an adult before I found out anything about it's thought maybe that the manger scene was not like the one we have out on the church lawn <laughs> at Christmas time, but rather it was a cave. It was inside of a cave. Although I did hear that as an adult, and I heard it at church. Um, the, the Gospel of James, circulating around the middle of the second century, has it in a cave in the first place. Yeah, the moral of the story is don't ride a donkey when you're seven months pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and the first thing he says to her when he gets her off the donkey is, there's no place here to hide your shame. <laughs> Well, maybe childbirth was a shame. Maybe somehow... I don't know. That could be. I, I think know. it was. Yeah. I think yeah. it was. Yeah. yeah, because again, the woman was unclean. Yeah, right. it was unclean. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Could be. Could be. I had never... I've never... I've never understood exactly... I guess I've heard that, though, that the woman's punishment for uh, the fruit of the, of the tree of right. good and evil is to have... Mm -hmm children and, and, and have pain, right? Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. well, yes. Uh, yes. Well, birthing uh -huh. children, yeah, that, that's part and, of it. And the man's was to toil on the soil forever and ever and ever and ever. That's right. right. I remember when the woman was unclean, she was untouchable. Right. Yeah. right. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think that had something to do with with her shame, as far as that goes, was the the act of giving birth. I mean, there's that 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 would be as unclean in many ways as as a period. Yeah, yeah, well, she and also it also then demonstrated that she had intercourse, and so that again was demonstrative. So that's the shame. The woman okay. always bears the shame of that act. I thought they'd been absolved of having sex. Well, we typically, I think we typically tell these stories and talk about these stories. Those of us that were raised in the church, and I guess we all were, but those of us that are raised in the church, uh, we talk about these stories as if they're factual, and then we try to reason out how they're factual. Right. Right. And, and so what if Abraham and Isaac and, and, and Sarah and Jacob and all that, what if that was just a story about, uh, you know, God's covenant related to the circumcision and all that, and then, and then the story of, of Moses and the escape from Egypt and all that, they don't, they don't think that really happened. A lot of scholars see no way in the world it could have happened. But uh, what if all of that is mythology that's been written in order to communicate the beginnings of the Jewish nation, right, and that right. a lot of the stuff that we that we know today also about Jesus and about a lot of different figures in the Bible is legend and uh, mythology. It's stories that are written long after the fact, because all those other stories were too long at thousands mm -hmm. of years after the fact. But the stories that are written after the fact. I don't. I don't necessarily think that we need to talk about the stories as if they were factual. Okay. Well, the days were a different time length. Well, then maybe they were. Maybe they weren't. I don't know. Maybe though. Maybe those days existed. Maybe they didn't. Um, Abraham, I still don't think he was gone for four years. Abraham and Sarah could could have a baby when they're ninety. Well, maybe they could. Maybe they couldn't. And maybe they weren't ninety. Or maybe they weren't Abraham and Sarah at all. There wasn't any <laughs> such people. Um, Just you know, throw stories at it to validate. Yeah. Huh? Was there really a Methuselah? You know, when you get down to it, was there? Was there? Wonder you know, when you're gonna get to him. Yeah. yeah. Was yeah. there a giant man that got hit with a rock in the temple and fell over dead? Uh, I, d I don't know. You know. Now at least you're sounding like a precept apologetic. I know. You could be wrong about it. Jan. You could be wrong about that. You know, I could be. <laughs> you could be wrong. Yes. I'm never wrong. How do you, how do how you, do know, you know? know? How do you know, Jan? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know nothing. <laughs> and he taught these this, this way to these people that they even name in our Bible as people of the way. Right. Okay? Right. So, in other words, maybe it was all about that. And all the rest of it was this admiration. They right. admired. They admired Jesus. They admired uh, Joseph, they admired Mary, they admired all of these people, David, and they admired Abraham and the Moses, you know, they admired yeah. them. And so when you admire people over time, 
Uh, read the legends. I'm, I mean, Joni was born in Kentucky and I was born in Tennessee. Get you out a book on Daniel Boone and get you out another book on Davy Crockett and check it out. You'll see what I mean. Yeah, okay? yeah. The stories are big. You know, killed him a bar before he was three. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's in the song. <laughs> yeah, I know it is. I know. I had the record. That you're not going to unwad this. No. You're not going to untangle this. What you may do, though, is adopt some beliefs, especially related to Jesus and following Jesus, that will actually help you in 2016. So here's the, here's the closing remarks. You may wonder why I share these ex-canonical books with you. I believe no supernatural story, much less one supernatural story over the other. These books are not brought for content, but for context. I hope what you see is that an argument over Christology and other aspects of the supernatural went on for hundreds of years before the Christian Bible came together. In this way, I hope you might see that Jesus may have indeed been a simple man teaching a simple way of life to a group of people known as people of the way. The supernatural stories that were added were not sinister, but rather just an ancient means of communicating ideas. It is my belief that there has never been anything supernatural. But there have been teachers like Jesus who have taught a way of being that is naturally super. This way brings contentment and peace between every two persons. Thank you for watching way to be TV. Thank you for your participation. We love you. See you next Thursday evening on way to be TV where there's a better way to be than atheist or theist. <laughs>